Ooh. I love the enthusiasm. Thank you. Makes me feel like I'm a little less like intimidated by the lights. I literally can't see anything. I wonder if this is how Lady Gaga feels when she's on stage. Okay. Um, can I have the screen, please? Anybody? May I? Yay. There we go. Okay. Um, thank you so much for uh, coming to this talk. It really actually feels a long time since I've given an in-person talk. And um, it's great to see so many people here when there are so many other great talks on. Uh, so my name is Paul Stack. I'm an engineer at Pulumi. Okay. Um, this is not a sales talk. This is a talk about actually helping you try and understand how to build different pieces of infrastructure in a better way. Now, what I mean by a better way is to have nice APIs around them. So I call this talk APIs for Infrastructure on Steroids, okay? because it's, it's kind of different to what you've seen before, and I'm hoping that you might actually be able to take a little bit of thought to go back to your own companies based on it. Quick straw poll. Hands up who manages infrastructure in the room. Oh, awesome. A lot of people. Hands up who does it on Azure. Hands up who does it on AWS. Hands up who does it on Google Cloud. OK, not many. And then lastly, um, hands up who uses Terraform. And hands up who uses Pulumi. OK, you're all my favorites, the Pulumi people. OK, so anyway, that's just I want to see like, the types of people that are here. Um, I'm very happy to see people actually being the right people in the room and that they're managing the infrastructure. And more importantly, that they're using a tool to do so. OK, I don't care what tool you use, just use a tool. Maybe not ARM templates. OK, so very, very briefly, we're going to look at where we've got to today or up to at this point. OK, so we're in this era of infrastructure as code. OK, but what actually is infrastructure as code? Code is kind of the wrong word for it, because there's different variations that people use. People use JSON, people use DSLs. So code is an encompassing term, rather than what you know is programming code or application code. OK, but it's a way of eliminating these manual, prone provisioning and changes to your infrastructure. OK, so if you're not using infrastructure as code, and you're clicking around in an Azure portal or AWS console, you're probably going to make a mistake. Okay? I have made many deletions of many <laughs> environments in my time. And uh, most, re uh, most recently, it was actually deleting the entire dev database. And all of a sudden, the team were like, uh, we've lost the database. I was like, whoops. Okay? So you don't want to be in this situation, OK? You don't want to be clicking around and just deleting stuff. But it's also infrastructure as code allows you to bring these best practices to your infrastructure management. There's software development best practices, OK? We've been doing this for years now. We send pull requests. We get reviews. We do things like lint our code. We do things like format our code. We use the correct IDEs in order to do things, OK? You can do that when you have infrastructure as code. When you're clicking around, you may have somebody sitting beside you making sure you don't do stupid things, but they might also not realize that you're doing a stupid thing. Okay? So code actually gives us the ability that we can have an audit trail and that we can see and get an idea of what is going to happen. And of course, all of the tools that are around these days, even ARM templates, have the ability that you can see what it's going to do in advance. Okay? You can plan, you can preview, you can dry run to see what is going on. Okay, you don't want to be YOLO in anything into production because it will cause problems. But why, why is it important? So that's what it is. What it actually is, is or why is it important? It's a, it's a way of automating it, and it's making it repeatable. You don't need to have scripts that does if, else, if, else, then, if, else, if, else, if, else, if. Okay? It's immutable. It will run again and again and again. And if it doesn't need to make any changes, it will not do so, okay? which means it's faster to run. Because if you're clicking around in a console, that takes a long time to navigate between pages, to choose the right things, to type things in. If you're using a tool, they can parallelize it, and they can use the APIs that actually are a lot faster to use going forward. And of course, because we can do these plans, we get these safe, predictable changes. We are in the cloud transition ecosystem at this moment in time. Whether we like it or not, the cloud is a thing. Okay? 
It's a scary thing. It's brought us all pain and misery at some point, I'm sure. Actually, anybody not use the cloud? One. So there you go. You can see it's everywhere, right? We are literally, every day we're not using it, okay? But there's different ways that people can use the cloud, and there's different entry points into the cloud for people. Okay, so you have people who have just moved their application servers and their database servers from their physical data centers to the cloud. Okay, perfect use case. Gets them in there, they can start using and taking advantage of the cloud, taking advantage of the scalability that's there. Then you have people who've gone a little more and they've started creating this hybrid environment where not only do they have their web servers and their database servers, but maybe they're being a bit cheeky and using something like Docker or containers. Okay, and they're experimenting and feeling like they're actually learning something as they go. And then you've got the batshit crazy people who have gone for the complete, dynamic, modern web setup. You've probably heard terms like cloud native and all these different things. That's what I mean here. Okay, now what that actually is, is a complete distributed application that all, there's so many parts and it could be multi-cloud, multi-region, there could be machine learning in there, there could be analytic driven systems in there, all sorts, okay? And as we start to head towards this, I'm going to say it's a nirvana, maybe? It's not really a nirvana for me. It sounds like a headache. But as we start going in this direction, where we have all these different systems interacting and connecting with each other, and we have things like service meshes and container orchestrators, then we cannot, we literally cannot click around in a portal. It's just not possible. Okay, so the more you want to go this direction, the more you have to embrace infrastructure as code. We've heard the term DevOps so much, okay? Uh, it's like 11 years old now. It means many different things to many different people. But what, one thing that we will agree on completely, it has transformed everything we do in the infrastructure ecosystem at this moment in time, okay? I used to be an ops person. I also used to be a developer. Okay, they never used to let me do too many things with development because I was a bad developer. But as an ops person, I used to be this blocker. Okay? I used to think about things like stopping developers pushing risky changes into production so that they would um, potentially not risk the environment. Okay? But that's kind of wrong when you think about it. Okay? Because being that blocker is not good. You're not... A lot, firstly, it's not a trust environment. If you don't trust the developer that they haven't actually thought through their changes and allow them to push it into production, you're kind of a bit of a, I'm not going to insert the curse word there, but you're not that type of person that sort of fits well in this type of ecosystem. But DevOps has changed it and it's wrapped it on its head. Okay? So right now, DevOps is the enablement of everything in an, in an IT organization at this point. The ops teams are no longer the blockers but they are the facilitators of putting systems into production. They put the correct tooling in place for you to do it. They put the correct monitoring systems in place for you to do it, the logging systems. They have SRE teams managing it in production. They are the people that keep the train on the track. You folks build software. They also build software. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. Without one, you can't have the other. These teams work so closely and there's such a symbiotic relationship that, that's why DevOps works really well here. The ecosystem is changing so much and so fast. In the beginning, there used to be tools like Puppet, Chef, Ansible. Um, then we started getting uh, CloudFormation came out. Then we had um, Terraform. Then we had Helm Charts. Then we had CDK came out. Terraform then released the TF CDK. We had Google Deployment Manager. We had ARM templates. We even have a new version of ARM templates now, which is basically a PowerShell DSL, if you ask me, called Bicep. Not a fan, I'm sorry. Um, I'm very opinionated, so just take what I say with a pinch of salt on that. Okay, and then like, we have like Terraform, Pulumi, all these different things. Okay? It is becoming such a diverse ecosystem of tooling that it's about, there are, there's no reason why you can't find a tool that fits your organization anymore. Okay, they're all available to use and they're all there, well documented with plenty of examples. But now that we have the tools, now we have the understanding, we're starting to realize that there's actually a progression of infrastructure as code. Okay? It used to be that it was like ticking a box, we are doing infrastructure as code. 
but you can push it in so, so many different directions. Okay? Infrastructure as code basically allows you to have declarative syntax, and a tool will reconcile how the changes get to the environment that you are targeting. Okay? What you see in front of you is TypeScript code that will deploy an AWS security group and an instance, and it will actually relate them in code to each other uh, because of uh, VPC security group IDs is group.id. And of course, you're looking up um, uh, sizes and constants and stuff. This is code, OK? This is actually code, and this is working code. You can take this, and you can use it. This is in Pulumi, and it's using Pulumi AWS. But it's declarative, OK? Even though we're using imperative languages, it's a declarative model, OK? Because you don't have to check that things have happened. The tool takes care of that for you. Terraform does the same. CloudFormation does the same. ARM templates, they all do the same thing. Then we started realizing, you know what? We can't just have flat infrastructure as code. We need to have a little logic, OK? And therefore, we started pushing the bounds of tools like JSON or DSLs, because if you try and shoehorn logic into a DSL or JSON, it becomes very difficult to read. Okay, so this is why we're pushing it a little further. We're understanding a little more about the ecosystem. And then you can start taking advantage of using built-in functions in the cloud. So for example, uh, splits and maps, if statements, conditional check, and all these different things in order to do things in a different way. Now that gives you untold capabilities. For example, you can say, if, this is, if environment equals production, set the replica count for your database to be five. If it's dev, set it to be one. Okay? Configuration over convention, because that's what we actually want here. Then we've gone a little further again. We have multi-provider workflows, where we have the inputs to some providers as outputs of other providers. So in this specific use case, what you're seeing here is you're storing Nginx in an S3 bucket, an Nginx configuration. And then you're using that S3 bucket to pull that Nginx configuration as part of a Kubernetes deployment. Okay, so you're storing it in one place, retrieving it in another. You can have different systems that push data in there. You can have a CI CD system that pushes your configuration into buckets or object stores or whatever you want. And then as part of your deployment, you can pull those out. A little further again, we started realizing that we want to be more advanced in our orchestration. So in this specific set of code, this is a, uh, a canary release. We're releasing a new version of the application. And usually, tools would have to do this in multiple steps. They deploy X amount of replicas. Then somebody would go and check something manually or run some scripts. Then they would come back and rerun the tool again. Okay? using real code and using um, the power of the language runtimes like we are here, what this is actually saying is, let's deploy the first three replicas of our application. Then we are going to write some code that will talk to Prometheus, check that application, monitor it for a period of time. I can't show you the internals of that class because it's not allowed. It's not public code, unfortunately. It was created by a customer. And once you're happy, once it does an error, you can continue with the next 10 replicas in the cluster. Okay? So we're, because we're using the imperative model, we're building on top of a language runtime, we're able to keep that application building and running until it's ready or until it errors. Okay? So we're pushing it a little further again. Then we realized that we needed to actually test some things. Okay? Like, who likes testing? Not really. Okay? It's slow. It's cumbersome to test in the cloud because what usually happens is that you spin up some resources and you write maybe some tests in something like server spec or uh, chef, can't remember the name of the tool because I've not used it in quite a while, um, in order to actually connect to the instances or resources and then make sure everything works and then you tear them down again. Not only is that slow, not only is it cumbersome, but it's actually costing money. Okay. Now, whether we like it or not, if you go to Amazon or Azure or Google and you give them a well-formed request, they will do something correctly and give you a well-formed response. Usually in our testing processes today, we are testing that the cloud provisioned correctly. 
okay? We don't need to do that. They do that a lot. And by the way, if the cloud doesn't provision correctly, you'll hear about it on Twitter a lot. So what we can actually do here is we can mock these APIs, okay? We can literally just say, hey, when I'm making a request to get this specific value or to do this specific thing, Amazon or Azure or Google are going to return this response, so I just want to check my infrastructure code directly, okay? Tests run in a second, maybe two seconds. They don't cost us any money, and you don't even need credentials on your laptop in order to do it. And I can show you that in a second. I wasn't going to, but I actually think the test inside of it is very cool. And lastly, we have gotten to the point where we actually are starting to do many things, and we want to create layers of abstraction and reusability again and again. Anyone tried to um, create a layer of abstraction over a JSON template? <laughs> I don't really think it can be done. Maybe it could be. Depends on how much beer you have, it might be able to be done. But being able to create APIs or packages or layers of abstraction, we're developers. This is what we're used to. You go to NuGet, you go to NPM, you go to Pipey, you have hundreds of thousands of packages that are APIs that we write code against. Okay, because that's all it is. It's just an encapsulation of code that allows you to do the same thing. Okay, we can create those ourselves for our infrastructure, and this is what I'm going to show you today in order to do it. So it's demo time. Any questions so far? No, well, people just want a nice sleep after lunch. Super hard to see with these lights. Okay, so I am going to create some infrastructure. Okay, those who know me realize that by doing this, I'm, uh, I'm, I've actually stepped up and leveled up as a person. I'm going to create some infrastructure in Azure. Okay? I usually choose AWS, but I'm trying to be nice these days. Okay? So this is Pulumi. Okay? Again, doesn't matter too much about the specific tool. We'll look at something dif different after this. I am going to deploy an Azure function, a JavaScript Azure function in Pulumi. Okay? And I want to show you how nice and declarative this actually makes it. So the first thing that we have to do to deploy an Azure function is we need a resource group in Azure. For those who don't know, it's a place in Azure that encapsulates all of the resources that go together that you deploy. Okay? After a resource group, we want to create a storage account. Now, here's the interesting thing. I am not typing that I want a V2 storage account. We have enums to do that for us, okay? Because writing strings, we make mistakes, okay? So we want to have enums to separate this out and to do it. And I can show you, if I didn't want LRS, I can actually choose GRS or so on and so forth. My IDE is doing this for me. It is literally giving me the values that I need. Then we need a blob container, okay? Our blob container, we have public access set to none. So please try and remember good security practices when you are storing things in the cloud. After that, we, uh, I didn't actually find the correct variables for this. So just pretend that they are. Actually, they might be here. Let's have a look. Web.sku. Yeah, we're just going to pretend that you see those, that those are actually variables. Okay. So we're going to create an app service plan. That app service plan is a dynamic tier, um, which allows us to scale because we're um, deploying a function. Then we want to create a storage blob. That storage blob will do something very cool. Pulumi has a couple of built-in functions with it that it will zip up that directory right there, which is called .javascript. It is the most sophisticated Azure function that you've ever seen, and I will show you how good that code is in a second. Okay, But notice that we're actually relating that storage blob to the resource group, the storage account, the container. Okay? Then we're going to generate a signed blob URL using a SAS token for the actual object itself. And of course, that's just code that I was able to refactor out. And we can actually just see like, what I'm doing. I'm just building a string uh, based on getting the SAS token for, uh, for the URL. Okay, and then lastly, we want to deploy a web app. Okay? The web app will be a function app. Um, it will have runtime node. It will point directly to that blob URL that has the SAS token, and it's going to run node 12. Don't know why I chose node 12. It's been that way in this example for about three months. Now, 
I told you that my example was very cool. It is literally, hello world. Yes. For those who know me as well, I don't write a lot of JavaScript, so this is as good as it gets for me. It is as good as it gets. Okay, so first thing we got to do with Pulumi. We have to say, uh, can everyone at the back see this? No, nope. let's increase the text size. Beautiful, okay? So the first thing we have is we have a pulumi.yaml file. Okay, a pulumi.yaml file is the entry point to the Pulumi program that the Pulumi CLI talks to and understands the type of Pulumi application that is being executed. In this case, it is Node.js or TypeScript, okay? But of course, you could swap in a Python application, a Go application, or C Sharp application, okay? And each of them do exactly the same things. Sometimes the SDKs are named kind of weird because we auto-generate stuff, but we're trying to fix that and be better. Okay, next thing we got to do is we got to create a stack in Pulumi. A stack you can think of as an environment, each developer can have their own stack, or even a customer, a tenant can have their own stack, okay? It is an encapsulation of state plus configuration, and they can be revved up, down, refreshed independently of each other. I am just going to say that my stack is called NDC Demo. Last thing I need to run this example is I need to set um, the location where I want to deploy this application into. Okay, you don't need to like set CLI commands. You can do this via CICD and it'll run it at the time. Okay, I am going to run this application in US West just because I tested it and it worked there. I didn't want to change it, didn't want to rock the boat. So the next thing we will do is we will run the command pulumi up. Okay, I promise I will get to more interest in stuff. This is just the basics of what it's doing, and more importantly, what developers are expected to be doing these days. Now, you will see that it, it creates the resource group, it creates the app service plan, the storage account, the blob container, the blob, and the web app. Okay, There's seven things it's going to do, and it will give us a full list of everything that it's going to do. We will not be surprised when this works or it does not work or it doesn't do things that we want, because we have the plan right there. Let's say yes and let's roll this out. And it takes about one minute to roll out. Now the first thing you'll see rolling out is a resource group because that is, Pulumi understands that that is the basis of everything else being created. After that, you will see that it's able to create the app service plan and the storage account in parallel because they don't have any relation to each other. They both depend on the resource group and the resource group is available. The service plan is now done and it will start the storage plan. After these two pieces of information are created, we can create the container, then we can create the blob, then we can create the web app. And you can see it's doing it in the exact order. It's deterministic. It will run in this same order every single time because it has relationships between the resources. Now, it's just going to finish the web app in a second, and then it is going to give me a URL on the screen. That URL will allow me to invoke the, Java function, or the JavaScript function but before I invoke the JavaScript function, I want to show you the item potent nature of what we're actually doing and showing that it will not change again. Okay, it's almost finished, I promise you. There we go. Okay, one minute and eight seconds. It was two seconds slower this time. If I run the same command, Pulumi up, it will give me a preview again of what it's going to do. But it knows that all of these resources are alive in the cloud already, and it's going to tell me seven unchanged operations. It doesn't need to do anything because they exist and they are active. Okay, so we'll just say no. Why would it ask you if you It's just trying to be like, so you, you can effectively like have outputs, extra outputs, and that's classed as an update because it's an update to your application. So it's kind of an update, but not of the resources themselves. So the terminology may be a bit misleading there. Okay, and then look, we have a, a page that will say hello from Node.js. So just to show you what it'll do again, if I change it, change the URL, instead of Pulumi, I can do NDC Oslo. And based on exactly what I was telling you a second ago, no resources have changed. It is an, up, an output that has changed only, but the application is going to say, do you want to perform the update? And this is exactly what it's going to do. Please, 
Anytime? It's thinking about it. There we go. And you can see that's the update it's actually going to do. And I'll say yes. And what we'll actually do is we'll invoke the function this time with a new request or a new parameter, and we'll get the, the, the updated response back. And here you'll see NDC Oslo. Oh, where are you gone? There we go. So we can see it's super easy. Now, and this is the most important thing. When you are giving a demo, remember to remove your code, otherwise it costs money. Anyway, um, so we'll go back to it. Now, this to me feels problematic. The reason it feels problematic is that if I want one of my developers to be able to deploy some infrastructure into the cloud, they need to understand the internals of the cloud. Okay? Yes, they have an API, uh, an API or an IDE to write code against, but they need to understand that in Azure, you have a resource group, then you have a storage account, then you have an app service plan, then you have a container, then you have a blob, and then you have to create a web app. And they need to know all these different things. Okay? Infrastructure is kind of becoming part of our job. The reason it's kind of becoming part of our job is that we want to move faster, right? Hands up anybody who's ever been delayed releasing something into production because of an operations team. <laughs> yeah, right? So we want to be able to move quicker, and by giving us this trust, this power, using these tools, that's what allows us to move quicker. But we're asking a lot of teams, okay? Deploying a simple thing can have many moving parts. Can we do better? Not only can we do better, but we must do better, okay? You don't want these complex infrastructure as code pages with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of lines of code to do the same thing again. And each person having to write their own variant of it and not following naming conventions or tagging conventions or all of these different things, okay? So we've done something slightly different at Pulumi. We have given people the ability that they can write their infrastructure code once and we will auto-generate SDKs in all of the Pulumi languages that go with it. I will show you what I mean. Now, I wrote some code a little earlier. Um, I, so I gave a workshop for two days, and I asked the team uh, in the workshop to deploy those functions that we did, and the questions that we got back were, I don't know what the variables mean, or it's very difficult to find out. So I changed my entire demo today to be based on that. Okay? Now, exactly that code that I, have re I, I just wrote a second ago, which will be this code right here. Okay, and this is in TypeScript. Okay, I transferred this into what is called a Pulumi component. Okay, so the first thing I did is I schematized it. The fact that I schematized it means I know the inputs, I know the outputs, what is required, and what will, um, what will have defaults. Okay, so I can say, I am going to create a function app. Okay, it can take a resource group, it can take a storage account name, it can take a blob container name, an app service plan ID, an application root. An application root is required because that can't have a default. And lastly, a function runtime, which is also required because we can't guess what the function is. Okay, we just can't. Okay, and then lastly, we will return a default host name, okay? Then I can specify that um, I, I want this to be built in C Sharp, I want this to be built in Go, I want this to be built in Node.js, and lastly, I want this to be built in Python, okay? So what Pulumi will allow me to do is if I open the code, I took exactly the same code. By the way, this is a template, okay? We, if you go to github.com slash Pulumi, um, if you have a look, Boilerplate, it is literally this, okay? Pulumi component provider, go boilerplate. It does all the work for you. You just have to fill in some code and add, change some variables around. Anyway, back to the actual code itself. So what I did is I translated everything that we had before into Go code. I just chose Go just to show that I'm not always a TypeScript person when I'm giving demos, but it would work exactly the same in TypeScript, okay? First thing I say is that if there is no resource group name, 
let's create a resource group because a user shouldn't have to understand even if they have a resource group. But in production, they may have to deploy into a correct resource group. Okay? We do the same for storage accounts. We do the same for blob container name. And we do the same for app service IDs. And this code is exactly the same as you can see. It is just goified. Okay? And lastly, we create a blob. We create a signed blob URL. And we created a web app. And we passed in some variables to the web app, like our function runtime. And of course, we can add in the variation of the provider. Now, the interesting thing here is if I run the command make build, if I can spell it right, then what it's actually going to do, firstly, it's going to use that schema, OK? Because that schema is super important. It actually tells our IDE. It tells the deployment, the preview, all of the different things if we have missed a variable, if we're um, passing in the wrong type, so if we want to pass a, an int and yet we're passing a string, or something like that. Okay? Once it has built that binary, it will then start to use code gen that we have written that is publicly available on github.com slash pulumi um, in order to take that schema and auto-generate the SDKs that go with it. You'll see the first one it's auto-generating is .NET. If I go back to, let me just show you. If I go back to my SDK folder, now you will see a new .NET SDK, and you will see something called function app. Okay, function app will have an output of default host name, and it will take some inputs that we can actually pass in. Okay, so application root, blob container name, function runtime, resource group name, and so on and so forth. Once it's finished the .NET side of things, this is where it's failed. Oh, no, it hasn't failed, which is good. And I definitely don't want that one. OK, the next uh, one we will see is Node.js. And surprise, surprise, it's built the same SDK in Node.js. It's following the same exact pattern because we understand how to write code gen for Node.js applications. So here you'll say the output. And here you'll see all of the different inputs that go with it. Then after that one, it will create Python. And Python, of course, is also the same. And lastly, it will create Go um, as part of it. Now, what's interesting here is the fact that, oh, there we go. It has done something. And for some reason, I haven't output Go. But that's OK. I'll fix that up. OK. Now, what we've done here is we've actually created an API. OK. And I've hidden away all that complexity that we had before. What have I got for time? I'm OK. OK. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make dir testing my API. And I am going to run a new template, OK? So actually, first thing first, before I do that, let's make install the Node.js SDK. What I'm doing is I'm yarn linking. Okay, And the fact that I'm using Yarn Link here, I can actually um, test this in a project without pushing it up to NPM and pulling it back down. I'm just being able to use the local package. Okay, And you can see it's Yarn. I'm linking an old one. And it's just linked a new version. And then it tells me, you can now run that command, Stack72, as your function. So let's go to testing. I am going to scaffold a new Pulumi application. And I am going to say, it is Pulumi TypeScript. It will ask me, what do you want to call the application? Testing my API is OK. Then it'll say, project description. Doesn't really matter. And then it'll ask me for a stack. OK, it's just dev is fine. Nothing, nothing bad here. Now it'll just download the entire NPM ecosystem, um, because that's how people build stuff. And now if I actually go back to my IDE, I have a new file. This is the basics of a Pulumi application. Out of the box, this will run Pulumi up, and it'll tell you it's all OK. OK? I need to do one more thing. I need to yarn link at stack 72 Azure function. And now it's available inside my project. So what I want to do is I want to say import star as Azure from at stack 72 Azure function. Okay. Now it didn't go red, so it means it knows it's there. 
Okay. What I want to do next is I want to say my function equals new Azure dot function app. What does a function app do? Test function. And then it tells me that there's some optional args that it needs to do. So let's have a look at what the args are, okay? Because we're in code, and funnily enough, we have an API. We can just step right into an API, and it's doing the work for me, okay? And what it says it needs is we can have an app service plan ID, an application root, a runtime container. I'm, not, I'm just going to give it um, application root, and the application root will be JavaScript. And I'm just going to copy the JavaScript example from there to here. And then lastly, I can say uh, function runtime. And, and if I really wanted to be clever and cheeky, I could actually have created some enums that people can choose very easily, but I'm a bit lazy today. Now, four lines of code. We have literally wrapped all that complexity that we had this first time around. Um, where are you, my code? We have wrapped all of this functionality, okay, which was 78 lines of code. And myself, as a nice operations person, can create a pipey package. I can create an npm package, a go module, and a .NET NuGet package, push them up to the registry, and let other people in my company take advantage of being able to deploy functions in four lines of code. Okay? This is the power of creating nice, simplistic APIs. If you give your development team and tell them in four lines of code you can deploy your Azure function, they will be very happy. They don't need to know the internals. And not only do they need to not need to know the internals, if it never happens, but if your company decides to switch clouds tomorrow or they want to go multi-cloud, your operations team can do the work inside that package, and it's, that implementation detail is not even exposed to your developers. Okay? Now, that's just writing it in code. Okay? I still got to create some, and I still got to do something. We can go a step further, literally a step further here. Okay? So I have a Kubernetes cluster. Okay? Uh, kubectl get nodes. And you will see, I'm really hoping it's still alive because I have a, an AWS uh, account cleanup command that runs at about 1 o'clock. And you can see I, I created this um, in, uh, Kubernetes cluster in, uh, in Amazon about uh, two hours ago, almost two hours ago. Okay? And there is nothing inside this. Okay? It is a plain standard Kubernetes cluster. Okay? Has anybody ever deployed an application into Kubernetes? Painful, right? Yeah, really painful. What you most usually have to do is you have to create a namespace, you have to create a Kubernetes deployment manifest, then you have to create a service. Okay. Now the code for that usually, um, not there, the code for that usually looks like In, in TypeScript, uh, like this, okay? In Pulumi, it would look like this, which is actually kind of nice because it's not YAML, where you would declare a namespace, you would declare a deployment, the deployment would have a template, the template would have some containers and uh, expose some ports, um, and then lastly, you would uh, leave a service that sits over the top of it, like a load balance service, okay? If I ask the development team that they had to go and understand the internals of Kubernetes, to deploy an application to it, it's kind of not fair, okay? It's, it's, it's a tool that I, as an ops team, have chosen, and now they have to learn all about the internals of Kubernetes just to deploy an application, okay? I told you Pulumi is code, and one of my amazing colleagues created a small demo app to show the power of code here. So firstly, he created a provider what, like I did. But secondly, he was able to create a CLI that goes with that provider. This is a simple Go CLI. And I literally mean the most simplistic Go CLI that you can see. And all it does inside, more importantly, it's able to invoke Pulumi. The fact it's able to invoke Pulumi from within code 
means that we can wrap code in code to make it even simpler to deploy. So what if I was to tell you that to deploy an application or an image, a Docker container or a, an application container that exists on either the registry or my local machine or our internal system in a single line of code. And what I can do is I can say prod app deploy image, the image name and the version, and a name. And in this case, the name will be NDC Oslo. And you are actually going to see what it does. So the first thing it's doing is it's running a refresh to find out if there's anything in the cluster matching that name. Then it's going to tell me exactly what it's doing. Okay? It's going to give me a list of things. The update on progress is on the left of things that it's actually going to do. When they're finished, they move to the right. So we've deployed a new namespace. That namespace will be prod app. Okay? It's currently rolling out a deployment. That deployment will just take a few, uh, a few seconds to go out. And it's almost finished. Any questions while we're waiting? How much? Yeah, like, like how much they cost? Here. No, 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 sorry. Oh, I see what you mean. So the question is, how much is, this, is the app um, itself doing versus Pulumi? Um, the CLI tool that I've just showed you, the demo one, has this updates in progress thing. Everything else is actually being done by Pulumi inside it. OK, in fact, I can show you that because I can go to app. Oh, not that one. App.pulumi.com. And I can go to my user. And I can go project. And I can search for prod app or not. If I do NDC Oslo. Oh, there you go. Production app NDC Oslo. It started five minutes ago. And Pulumi is actually doing all of this work. You can see I tested this quite a lot today. <laughs> Um, and you can see everything that it's doing. So currently, it's doing the namespace. And once it's finished the namespace and so on, I have a feel of my clusters being torn down in the middle of this. But that's OK. It doesn't really matter. So the thing is, is that I can just tell a developer, hey, in order to take that application that you're running and testing that you actually need to run in your production, or excuse me, in your, in your dev environment or your testing environment, your staging environment, you just need to run that single command with the correct credentials that allows them to access that command they don't have to worry about anything. In fact, production app to them may not even be Kubernetes. It could be ECS. It could be an app service. It could be a function. It could be anything. It's up to you of what you want to do and what you want to put in there. And if you really want to, the people also created a web app. Like, actually, a web app. I'm not even joking. So production app, you go into it. This is an open source repo, by the way. You can go to web, and it's running a Flask website. Okay. So in order to deploy an application, a user would just go to a local internal production service or in a platform as a service. They just enter some, some details, click deploy, and in the background, Pulumi is running the deploy on your behalf. Okay. This talk is not specifically about Pulumi. This talk is about understanding we can do better, we must do better, we have to help actually make things better. Okay? We can't be getting bogged down in having to go and find out how you deploy five different things in a cloud when you just want simplicity and speed and the ability to iterate fast. Okay? Because when we are taking that time, we are not adding value for our customers. I told you before, operations teams and development teams used to be at each other's throats. They are now starting to, the best and most successful IT companies are starting to realize that these two teams must work very well together. Because you can't have infrastructure if you don't have applications to run on it. Otherwise, it's just a cost. And you can't have applications unless you have infrastructure to run on them. Okay. Now, we have to understand that that's a thing. And when we work closely with these people in order to do it, that's what we're trying to do. Now, I showed you that I had a test Kubernetes cluster. 
today, okay? We dog food a lot of these APIs. We're continually creating APIs around things at Pulumi in order to make our lives easier, okay? Now, a Kubernetes cluster has to sit inside a VPC in um, Amazon, and a VPC is made up of so many different parts, like uh, subnets, internet gateway, route tables, routes, route table associations, potentially NAT gateways, and elastic IPs, and all these different things, okay? If I asked everybody in this room to go and deploy a VPC in Amazon, half of the people would do it one way, and the other half of people would do it in many other different ways, okay? Because there's so many different ways to do it. In TypeScript, I can deploy a VPC in five lines of code, okay? Literally, and it's, it's, I'm not going to say it's like a production-ready VPC, because it's not. You need to give it other configuration, like CIDR blocks and the number of availability zones and all these different things. But for all intents and purposes, for a test system, the biggest amount of code that I've written as part of that VPC is to add tags, okay? Now, also, to deploy a Kubernetes cluster, you need to create the cluster, you need to create the, the worker nodes that go with the cluster, you need to start creating some uh, CNI configurations, all these different things. Managing Kubernetes is complex. Six lines of code to deploy a Kubernetes cluster. That's what deployed that two-node cluster that is currently running in my cloud. And it is sitting in my uh, VPC, it's sitting in the public subnets, please don't ever do this, but I needed to be able to get access to it without a bastion box, okay? So I just wanted to be able to connect to it very easily. And lastly, I could pull the cube config out of it, okay? So not only have I deployed a VPC, subnets, internet gateways, elastic IPs, NAT gateways, routes, route table, route table associations, all of the pieces of Kubernetes in 24 lines of code. And as you can see, I could probably minify that to make it much smaller, okay? I try and make it a little more readable. And then even on that, anyone use AWS Lambda and API Gateway? Couple, okay. I have one last example of a system that we actually wrote to do this. So we have a new package called Pulumi AWS API Gateway. Now for those who have ever tried to deploy stuff to Amazon around um, Lambda as an API Gateway, you know that you need the Lambda, you need an IAM rule, you need a Lambda permission, you need the API gateway, an API gateway stage. You need to then be able to link the Lambda to the correct place, and it's quite complex. In TypeScript, what we can do, we can declare what's called a callback function, okay? This is a Lambda callback function that we've written, it's like an internal wrapper, that we just write our Lambda code, or you can pass it a location of Lambda code. Okay, Pulumi understands that everything in here becomes the body of the Lambda. The fact that it becomes the body of the Lambda, it's able to extract that Lambda from the code, package the Lambda, push the Lambda to Amazon. Then we declare a REST API. That REST API has a collection of routes, and a route, in this case, the slash route, which is a get route, points to an event handler called F, and that event handler is our callback function, okay? You can see it's very developer-focused. It's very simple and easy for developers in order to follow and see what's going on in the system. Now, the nice thing about this is you can have many routes that are actually all very easily specified in the different ways, but Pulumi will understand how to resolve the dependencies in order to get there. We have so many more examples of API on steroids, like so, so, so many more. The last one, okay. Anyone use Jupyter Notebooks? Okay. Told you Pulumi's code, right? Don't know why we'd ever do this, but it was a cool demo when somebody wrote it. You can have Jupyter Notebooks executing your Pulumi code. <laughs> if you really would like to do that, and that's where you work, and that's the type of system you do, you can see what it's doing. That's actually Jupyter Notebooks running and invoking your Pulumi code. There's a lot of great things when you're actually in code. As I said, it's not specifically about Pulumi itself. It's a, you can create layers of abstraction with Terraform. Okay? You can create Terraform modules that have nice, simplistic APIs that your users are able to do. 
It's about being sensible and bringing that software development skill into infrastructure. And I, show, I, I told you one more thing um, about how you would mock your infrastructure in the cloud, and I wanted to show you that I wasn't lying about that. I have six minutes. Um, and we have a load of examples. This is uh, github.com slash pulumi slash examples, and you can go and have a look at it. Now, if we have a look at unit testing using Mocha in AWS, uh, excuse me, for AWS infrastructure, then what we're saying is we want to declare a security group. We want to get some details of an AMI. An AMI is a machine image in Amazon. Okay? We want to declare an EC2 instance. And then lastly, we want to get the public IP addresses. Okay? Now, what we can do is we want to say, write some tests. Okay? So what we want to do is we want to say, the server must have a name tag. Okay? We have a policy in our company that you must tag all your infrastructure. So you can write some code that says, it must have a name tag. If it's missing, throw an error. It must not use user data because we don't like random injected scripts being deployed into our web servers. We actually like things to go through AMIs and full testing cycles. And then we can do things like security groups must not be open on port 22 so that people can actually just SSH directly into your instances. Okay? They need to be hidden away. If I go, um, actually, let me open a new window here. Uh, the reason so is if I say env grep AWS, there are no AWS credentials in this terminal session. Okay, cd go, source, github, pulumi, examples. I'm very regimented at where I keep my source code, I'm sorry. Like super regimented. Uh, so if I say testing, uh, unit, ts, okay, and here is the code, right? This is exactly what, oh, sorry, mocha. This is exactly the code that you saw in the other window. One thing I will show you, though, before I continue. Here is where we set the mocks. Okay? And it's literally like a mocking framework. Okay? So if it's a call to a new resource, and we're trying to get a security group, return this set of data. If it's an instance, return that set of data. And if we're making a call to the API just to get some read-only data, here is what it's going to return. If I run the command, Mocha. Wait, what? Somebody changed the command on me. Yeah, oh, there we go. That's why. OK, so running Mocha, we can say run the ec2tests.ts, and it's just starting the Mocha web server right now to give me the results back. It's declaring the infrastructure, and we can see. In one second, I can see that I'm already breaking my tests. Okay? It's tested. Hook it into your CI CD pipeline before any deployments go out. It'll run the test to make sure everything's good. Okay? We, are ha we are leveling up in this area. We need to continue leveling up in this area. The cloud is a scary place. When we make mistakes, we need to learn from those mistakes. When we're writing application code and we make a mistake or a bug gets introduced, what do we do? We usually add a regression test. We could do the same thing in infrastructure. Exactly the same thing. You write a test like this, the next time it gets deployed, it'll never, it'll never bite you again. Each time, it's one thing to remember. We may be smart. There are always smarter people on the internet who will find ways around to break our systems. And because they are breaking our systems, we need to continually learn, and we continually need to make our systems better and better to keep them secure and keep our users secure. With that, I want to say thank you so much. Um, everything I've shown here today is all open source and free, and you can go and you can play with it. Um, if you have any questions or emails, please, you can get me paul at pulumi.com. I'm not very good at emails. I have really not good at emails, but you can find me on Twitter, and I'm great there, although I'm very opinionated. But um, we're believing that by moving in this part of the ecosystem and driving everyone forward, we're creating a nice cloud engineering culture for everybody to enjoy and drive forward. Thank you all so much. And I have five minutes for questions if anybody has a question. Don't all ask at once. It's fine.
Anybody? Oh, shout. Gotcha. So the question is, is that I've showed how to wrap Pulumi using uh, Go or Python or TypeScript or anything, and is that actually invoking the CLI under the hood? Great question. It's something I should have covered. Thank you for that. Pulumi has this idea where we have an automation API. Our automation API allows us to embed Pulumi code in actual code, and it's running against the APIs under the hood. It's not directly invoking the CLI. Any other questions? Shout. Yeah, you showed uh, that Pulumi website. Does everything run through that? Great question. Great question. So I showed the Pulumi website, OK? Sales cap on. Not really. Um, everything in Pulumi is free. Like CLI, SDKs, everything is free. Where you store your state is where you can incur some costs, OK? The, the site that I showed is the Pulumi SaaS that you would pay for but you don't have to use the Pulumi SaaS. You can log in to an S3 backend or an S3 bucket or an Azure key blob, um, or excuse me, Azure blob storage or a GCP um, bucket, and also you can store it locally. You do not have to use the, the Pulumi backend, the SaaS with Pulumi itself. Okay? Any others? I think there's one more maybe. If they do shout, please, because I can't see. Awesome. Thanks, everyone, so much. Enjoy the rest of the week.